Okay, so welcome to this SOAS Center of Taiwan Studies uh, film screen. So it's part of our Understanding Taiwan Through Documentary and, and Film uh, series. I'm really delighted to welcome um, Professor Mark Moskowitz uh, from University of uh, South uh, Carolina, um, and who's the film's director, and also Ray Tung, who's the, uh, the film's uh, technical director. Um, and they're going to um, after they say a little bit about the film uh, before we do the screening, uh, and then we'll have a kind of more a longer kind of uh, Q and A. Um, now this is the second session that, that Mark's uh, done with us. Last night he talked about um, the new paperback book, Popular Culture, uh, in uh, in Taiwan, and uh, in that book Mark looks at um, Harry Potter. Uh, reading Harry Potter in Taiwan. I think it reflects the kind of um, very diverse kind of uh, research that, that Mark's been doing, looking at things such as um, uh, popular culture, pop music uh, in Taiwan. In, in many ways, the kind of stuff he does um, is one of the reasons why I think it's so wonderful to be in this field of Taiwan study. I'm a political scientist, but by being involved in this field, I get exposed to uh, subjects such as what we're going to look at in, in, the, in the film today, funeral stripping. <laughs> um, and as I, as I was kind of walking over to my last class, it made me think about the topic that we were looking at um, in some of my classes today and yesterday. Um, and there's a little bit of overlap, we've been looking at political corruption. And it seems to me that um, there's some nice parallels between corruption and funeral stripping. <laughs> and, uh, and, and one of the problems we have when we look at Taiwanese politics is we tend to look at it from a, a Taipei perspective. Um, and we kind of forget that there's so much diversity uh, in Taiwan. And um, urban rural diver uh, diversity. And political corruption is one such example where we have our kind of values and norms on what is acceptable in terms of uh, popular culture, political corruption. We have a huge difference. And I think there's a nice kind of way of linking now a morning's class with the topic of this film. So now I'm going to uh, hand over to Mark just to talk a little bit about uh, the film. Um, and he'll be able to go into a lot more detail in the um, uh, Q&A session. So let's give Mark a big kind of so as well. Thank you all for, uh, well, I, can you hear me without the microphone? You can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all for coming. I'm really delighted you're here. And, and I think at SOAS, it's a particularly challenging thing to decide where to go because you have so many choices. So we're, we're both very flattered you came tonight. I want to thank Daphne. Uh, this has been a wonderful experience for us. Uh, not, not just the talks, but just experiencing London again. It's been a long time. And uh, it's such a wonderful city. Basically, the film uh, came because I would studied Taiwan for a number of years. I'd lived in Taiwan for 10 years if you add it all up. It was kind of home. And I wanted to try to do something with film. I'd always written before. And, and I had heard about funeral strippers uh, or electric flower cars, as they're also known, for years and years and years. And I thought this would be a good film topic. Uh, the bad side, I should warn you, is I knew nothing about making films. I, I had never used a camcorder, even a $5 camcorder. I had never used editing software. My school, basically as part of the condition of my going there, it was a new job, I said, hey, can you buy me this equipment? But they said, yeah, sure, here's your equipment, go have fun. That was the extent of training I had. <laughs> and so one of the things, one of the reasons Aure, uh, my wife, uh, is is so uh, pivotal in this film is I, I, I couldn't do the editing software. It, it conflicted with the PC I had to have it. And she was able to go online and find the Chinese language instructions uh, and then uh, kind of explain, OK, here's the glitch, and here's how we fix the glitch. And also, although I speak Mandarin fairly well, I don't speak Taiwanese, so she was very pivotal to helping me understand what we had filmed if it was in uh, Hoking. Uh, so this is the, these kind of dynamics. And so uh, with that, I apologize to begin with and, and hope you enjoy the film in spite of our, my weaknesses. Thank you. Um, 
watching you enjoy making that, that film. <laughs> Actually, uh, at the time it was so hot, and I was I was running down streets with you know 60 pounds of equipment. It was completely uh, not the same experience. As well. <laughs> I mean, one um, as a political scientist, I've got to uh, ask this question because occasionally um, uh, we hear talk about um, strip shows in election uh, campaign rallies, and it was kind of. It did get one mention, and I have seen one or two um, pictures from the uh, early to mid 1990s, but I've never been fortunate enough to actually find these kind of performances. I wonder, <laughs> when did this actually uh, come up in your kind of discussion? It, it was it was pretty rare that they brought it up. I didn't actually witness a political rally with this. Um, the, the three shining girls, I think, just before I interviewed Sean Butler, father manager, uh, they had just done a performance in Taipei, actually. But it was, I think, a more uh, restrained show in some sense. And so regionally, you know, where, where you are in Taiwan, if you're near the city or near the countryside, this changes things a lot. You know, before we continue, I should talk about what we saw technically, because we just uh, showed the same film in Manchester, and I was horrified because in Manchester the screen was bright yellow throughout the entire film. That something about their equipment transformed the film into this almost cartoonish vision. <laughs> uh, here, the color was quite beautiful, but it was much darker than usual, and it, it had narrowed the image, so everyone looks much smaller, thinner uh, than, than in real life. And the skipping, that, that sound burst at the end, that's never happened before. So, just, you know, uh, just so you're aware of the, where the film begins and ends, technically. Um, one other thing I was wondering about was um, where the, uh, these, these scenes were filmed. I, I presume we're talking about places like Yudli in the countryside. And, and do you see a real big difference in terms of um, the views of this kind of performance between someone like Taipei and the countryside? Uh, good, good question, Dan. Uh, basically, um, in the mid-80s, when it really started to hit the popular press, it was being it's just everywhere, just everywhere. Uh, city centers up and down Taiwan. The only place that was not taking place was downtown Taipei, which was the capital of the country. By the time we filmed, uh, it was more or less restricted in, in inner city. So it, it moved to the periphery, including Taipei, interestingly enough. And so the, the government uh, was really much more strictly monitoring, uh, thank you so much, monitoring what was going on with this. And so we, we had the privilege to, to interview a couple of government officials, which is very nice, and that was because of uh, Ray, do, do you want to talk about that? Or? Yeah, sure. Um, is this on? Yes. 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 It is. Can, it's you on. can you hear him? Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay, yeah. Um, first thing I want to back him out. Yes, he did enjoy it because that was his last <laughs> And he really carried 100 pounds. It's basically, he carried another me, including me, so two me together, <laughs> film that film. Um, and these two government officials, because back then I was working in the legis working for a legislator, so I have some relationship with these gov government officials, and happen to know one of them actually uh, draft the restricted regulation about um, about the electric electric. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a scholar, and this I'm not normally under the spotlight. So, um, so uh, that that's it. That um, so very fortunately, we'll be able to interview this government officer. If under the normal channel, I'm not sure if we will have chance because it's kind of forbidden topic in the political field. People obviously they don't support it, but they don't want to talk about their point of view either. So um, very fortunately, and thanks to my boss, although he won't hear that. <laughs> and in Taiwan, uh, I, I think very much, as with many countries, it's very focused on connections, who you know. And, and so we, I was so lucky because I already graduated from Taida in the, in the law department. 
which is where most of the big officials, government officials, uh, graduate. And I was also lucky because uh, the, this practice had taken a, a real beating in the popular press. It had been really very criticized, usually by educated men living in the capital. Uh, women outside of Taipei didn't care. Uh, in general, women didn't care one way or another. Men uh, outside of Taipei uh, either didn't care or loved it. Uh, <laughs> And so one of the issues when we did this film was the fear of us, uh, the fear, are they going to be like the Taiwan press and really persecute us, distort things? And I was so lucky to have uh, Are introduce us because she's from the south of Taiwan uh, and, and uh, is an uh, uh, aborigine from Taiwan. And so I think people felt much more trustful of her because of that position in society than had it just been me or had it just been uh, uh, a Han Chinese from Taipei. So, so really this film would have been impossible without Ares' uh, assistance. started probably from 15 to 20s um, you might think it's underage but they some they when they if it's 15 they they, really, they they probably don't dress like that so they probably it's dressed more um, covers more um, but they, they start training from 15 because a lot of them because the family also the community as one of the interviewees say they grew up in this environment their parents are managers so it's a more like a family business to them so and for them it's an honorable job so they won't feel like they're being looked down on to because friends around them they work very hard for this profession and um, I remember one of the interviewee, I'm not sure, maybe it's Fontaine here or one we didn't show. She told me that even they, they perform in all kinds of situations. Even it's raining, it's storming. If they are hired, they have to stand on that stage and perform. So unlike pop star in the, in the screen, they are under the roof at least that make keep them safe. And they have to climb to that pole. And if it's raining, a lot of times the pool is very slippery. So they, they get hurt. So it's not a job you think is, you, you might, a lot of people might think it's so easy. You're just singing and then kind of just, you know, shaking on the stage, but it's not like that. So I think a lot, that's why a lot of people keep them criticized without understanding what the job is. Um, about um, what, the second, Prostitution, or are they abused by Canadians? Yes, please. Okay. Um, actually, you know, one of the things I was struck by that I didn't expect is, is it reminded me very much of a circus community or a gypsy community, in that they were very stigmatized outside of their community, but they really watch out for each other. So, to my knowledge, I, I just never heard of any sexual abuse, no pimps, no. Uh, nobody even accosted because often the, their managers were their relatives and they were watching out for each other very very carefully and as I already pointed out because of that very close dynamic if anything I, I think they were far safer than say uh, a waste waitress perhaps at a more risque kind of venue uh, but, but it's an excellent question Okay, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, we've got BU and then uh, Ben at the back. Oh, and, and, oh, so yeah, we're building up a few questions. And BU, yeah. I, I forgot to thank you. Thank, thank you as well for having us here. This is wonderful. Uh, I have two questions, if I may. Uh, the first one, uh, because in the film, um, all sort of different occasions were sort of mixed together. For example, uh, 
performing for weddings, to funerals, to birth, babies' birthdays, or whatever. But uh, can you let us know, just elaborate a little bit, what's the difference between the entertainment for different occasions? Was there, for example, especially pole dancing, for example, is it especially popular among funerals or, or for political campaigns? I don't know. And, and can you just elaborate on that? The second question is, uh, I noticed that mostly for men. So is a men's entertainment, is it the case or maybe I just got it wrong? Can you? Good. I mean, particularly thinking about the audience, because that was the one of the things yes. I was going to ask as well about what is the kind of the gender breakdown in the audience. Yes. Because at least from the clips we saw, it looked quite kind of family yes. based actually. This yes. is quite mixed yes. actually. Um, I, I think uh, the only difference with the performance might be uh, in location rather than the kind of event they were celebrating. Uh, so rather than divided uh, from birthday to funeral. Uh, so all it, the performances are the same, no matter what. Just well, the I think they, they, they did change. Uh, the closer you got to the city, the less likely you were to see full nudity. And, and uh, so, for example, we didn't actually witness full nudity, uh, in part, I think, because I was filming. And, uh, but I hear it's very, very prevalent in the countryside. Uh, that seems to be the main division, that, that it's a funeral or, or a wedding, or perhaps political event is more restrained. I don't, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, it, it, one, one assumes, I did when I first started, that it's for a male audience. And, and I think to some degree this is true. It's, it's primarily uh, with the desirous gaze in mind, and given Taiwan's homophobia, uh, I, I don't think people are thinking this is also for women's pleasure, which I think it is in some instances. Um, but uh, I, I think one difference that, that does occur is, is uh, the educational level of the children of the deceased sometimes comes into play in, in really interesting ways. And so sometimes women, uh, less often, but sometimes women have these funeral strippers hired for their funerals, maybe a, a fourth of the time. Uh, sometimes they do it because it, it's a temple celebration for the gods. Sometimes they do it because they loved it. You, you saw that. Uh, the only complaints I've seen within communities, again, not from Taipei government officials, is perhaps a, a usually son uh, is now living in Taipei, uh, is, has now graduated from university, and now uh, has become a bit worried about this, what does the world see this phenomenon as? And, and I think even the government officials uh, are less concerned with the sexuality of it than the fact that they're aware that the West finds it amusing or troubling. And, and this becomes an interesting dynamic as well. But it, it's, the stigma is partially the gender issues we might predict for this, what kind of role model is this, et cetera. But I think by and large, it's really much more about, oh, oh no, we don't want the outside world to look down on us. And, and that becomes an interesting dynamic as well. Good, good, good great questions. Uh, yeah, Ben. Um, yeah, real eye of eye of my family from Northern Ireland where we had a funeral pretty much three days of, after someone's died with a history in that. So it looked like those funerals took about a month to prepare and get everything ready. Um, my question is, um, because it seems like an area or a venue or a place where you can go against the conservative norms of a society, uh, what, how do you compare that? With, it has this, an element of significance of grandeur as well, which usually in major major events there's a, a conservative element to in other cultures. How, why, why does Taiwan sort of break the mold in that way? And uh, is there other male or transgender, uh, you touched on yeah, sort of homophobia a bit, but are there, are there a growing market, I guess, for uh, male, transgender, yeah. other roles? So, yeah. Do you want to? Okay, okay. Um, um, 
Unfortunately, I'm getting to the age where I forget as, as a conference, so I may need you to remind me of some parts of the, the three-part question. But let me start from the back and work our way forward. Uh, occasionally, there are men uh, performing, even to the point of men and women pantomizing sex acts on the stage. Uh, uh, transgender, I've, I've heard of one case of it. I didn't witness it uh, particularly. I didn't, I didn't see it firsthand. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right that this becomes a time to transgress normal, normalized views of sexuality. And at Taiwan, I think people perceive of themselves as being quite conservative. I'm not sure I agree. I think, in fact, the, the number one reaction my Taiwanese friends have when they go to the U.S. is how boring uh, the U.S. is, how conservative Americans are. I, they, they go there expecting to have a lot of fun. Because they think of Americans as a bit morally depraved and, and are so disappointed by the religious element and such. Um, but, but one thing I think we, we all have to do, and, and in doing this film I learned a lot as well, and that is question our assumptions about how one marks uh, a, a, what we would call a solemn occasion. Uh, very recently, you know, we've been hitting the museums because London has such wonderful museums, and I was thinking about this issue because we have such a culture of solemnity in museums as well. You have to be quiet, you have song, no food. Why? Why not go in there and get drunk and have fun, you know? Uh, certainly the paintings were hanging on walls where people were getting drunk and having sex and doing all these kinds of things. And I think it's our puritanical background that is shaped our view of what you do as a marker of respect. Uh, my father passed away uh, about 10 years ago. My mother passed away a couple of years ago. And I'm not a good emotion guy. I cry about once every 10 years. I don't deal with emotions very well. So for me, it was very hard to process this. And I was thinking how wonderful it would be to go somewhere with just this enormous range of distractions, music, and sights, and sounds, and like the Irish wave, maybe make it a celebration of the person's life, rather than a, a sad uh, marker of their passing. Did, did I leave, I feel like I left one point out. Did I, or did that kind of cover? Terrific, well good, my, my brain's working better than I thought. Thank you, it's a great question. One is this lady at the, uh, okay, um, the front and then the one at the side, and then we've got the one right behind you, so we're getting quite a lot of questions, and Dean as well. Uh, thank you for the, the film. I have one question and one comment. Okay. Um, the question is for you, for the director, as well as for the audience from Taiwan. Um, um, can you assume that this kind of street dance during the funeral is mostly for uh, the male deceased? But not for the female deceased. Have you ever encountered any street names in the funeral that is for the death of mother or the death of woman in the family? This is a question. And then, because I did some research on this things about China. So it happens to be that one of the researchers get to interview the first person who transformed. The, the car mm -hmm. into a, a real public uh, electronic flower car. And uh, they, he, this person is from Taizhou, Xian, Taizhou province. And he's, he was saying, actually, the before the, the, these entertainers uh, worked on electronic flower cars, it, it's kind of transformed from the old women's breath thing. Mm -hmm. It's part of the generalization mm -hmm. process. Well, and, and that's an interesting issue. I, I think, uh, you know, this, this is thought of as being a very, very traditional activity. And to some degree it is. We, we had farm team talking about ox carts before. But it didn't really hit the public till the mid-80s. I mean, that's when it hit the press. That's when it became popular. So historically, that's a pretty modern phenomenon. And all the lights and the, the diesel trucks with the, the electric thing, machinery, it's, in that sense, it's also very modern. So um, the, the, to me, as an anthropologist, the ways it represents tradition at the same moment that 
for the, those engaged in it, it, it doesn't represent tradition at all. It represents something very modern, and exciting, and, and perhaps tradition only to the point that, well, this is what we should do to show our respect. Uh, from interviews, uh, people told me that approximately one-fourth of uh, Dienzo uh were, were for female disease. And so it's not just for men. Um, but uh, I did not hear of a woman requesting this. Say, for example, when I die, I really want those female <laughs> stories. Uh, whereas I did hear many stories of men uh, requesting it. So there is a gen there's clearly a gender bias, but not to the extent that I would have thought. I, I, I was actually, if anything, I was surprised at how ubiquitous it was among uh, poor communities, regardless of gender uh, um, or religion, really. Yeah. Um, you, you kind of already answered my question a little bit. <laughs> but um, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about um, what the press and the state's uh, grounding for their criticisms are of this. Because it, it doesn't, it seems to be about uh, tradition, how this is going against tradition. Um, but it never really seemed like, um, yeah, the idea that they're being objectified never really seems to come into yeah, this. Yeah. Uh, in fact, most of the criticism I've seen has been Chinese language press, uh, that, which has just been very vicious towards it. And I think there has been some discussion uh, about the gender issues, but you're right, for the most part, it's more about. Uh, you know, this is backwards. Why, why are we not modern? And these kinds of things. Uh, so again, I, I think to some degree this is with an eye to the West. And, and Taiwan is, is funny about this. That to me, the best parts of Taiwan society are the things that they're trying to control. Night markets, for example, uh, used to be these wild, crazy, wild zones where anything went on. And then they came in and put these restrictions, and now, you know, there's a KFC and a McDonald's right in the night market, there's a Gap selling clothing. And so part of the attempt to restrict Dian Zuo is is the gentrification of Taiwan to some degree, mm -hmm. and, and the acute desire to be global citizens in very, very profound ways. Does, does that answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Terrific. Yeah, question. Yeah. 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 So uh, I have two questions. Yes, please. So one is I'm quite curious that uh, is this business is quite competitive or is like one of two family business controlling the zone business? The second question is uh, what do the government really do to this situation for the phenomenon? Because I have seen that simply since there, there's police over there, yeah. and some government say that we have to bring them to good direction or not the bad direction. So what the government do actually do? Um, I think I can answer the competitive question. Um, I think there's two level. The performers, they have agents. So there's a performer industry there. And there's also dance Hwasa manager, they have the car, they have the stage. So the, the both of both of industry are very competitive. In one county, you may have, um, I don't know the exact statistics, but the, they always say the competition is so hard, we hardly can survive, and we are just small family run, somebody may be richer, somebody in a better location. So I would say the competition is very hard, and for the performer industry as well, because um, a lot of them and hired by different agents, and the agents, they, they were getting business through their agents. And so it, it is very competitive through that, this industry. And, and uh, legally, I think the, the, the laws were actually fairly restrained. Uh, uh, everything you saw was legal. And we made a very conscious choice of that because we did see some things that were not legal. And, uh, you know, because they had become so, uh, um, they've been so attacked, and you know, the, it re it's a very big division between anthropology and, say, journalism. The journalism, all the stuff I cut out were the money shots. That's what would have sold the film. But as an anthropologist, I, I felt a certain responsibility. Um, the basic law is no full nudity, 
And so when you saw those police and with the cameras, they were, it was essentially self-monitoring at that point. And, and because the, the people performing saw them, uh, just as they saw me. So they weren't about to do that in front of a camera. And so that, that becomes an interesting dynamic. And, and to some degree, in the US they do this with traffic. They'll just put a police car there, nobody in it. And it, people slow down because of that empty police car. And, and by sending those two policemen there with a camera, it stopped the problem. Uh, and, and they could have taken a very different approach, like they, they had the mainland, where they, they go undercover and then arrest people, and it becomes a very serious thing. So, you know, it, it, when I was interviewed for the Taipei Times, the, the reporter felt that I had made the government officials look a little silly. <laughs> and I, you know, now that I, I watch it again, I, there's an element of that. And I, I didn't mean to do it at the time. I meant to create something that was very well balanced, but my own biases kind of sank in. And it wasn't until uh, I showed, I was teaching a class at Peking University for one semester, and, and uh, it wasn't until I showed it there that it, it struck me how incredibly and wonderfully restrained the government officials were. That, uh, had it been a Peking, uh, Peking, a Beijing uh, government official, there would have been none of that hesitation in the speech. It would have been, they need to stop, this is immoral, you know? And, and so, it, my, really my only true regret about the film is, is I, I think unintentionally I was a little bit unfair about that. Because in fact, what they were stopping were things like uh, very Thailand-esque, performances that had taken place before that. I, I spoke with one anthropologist who was in Taiwan uh, in, in around 85 and saw a woman squirting water out of her private parts. And, and so, you know, it, in retrospect, I think I have a little bit more sympathy to the idea of where do we draw lines. At the time, I was just so obsessed with protecting the women who had been attacked. Excellent. I mean, one thing that your question made me think about was the um, cross-strait service agreement. Um, and, um, <laughs> a whole new service, <laughs> right? Uh, could this be opened up to uh, mainland Chinese investment? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Dean. I think there'd be a, a march against that. <laughs> um, what, first, I want to thank you both um, for the film. It's very uh, interesting for... Um, for people like myself, this is a, this is a new concept. And, um, I'm, I'm very open, open to anything. Um, <laughs> Something for interpretation. Um, what I want to ask is, um, the, especially the, uh, the kind of the entertainment stripping, you know, even like it was outdoors, like an open, like it was an open air event. Um, was it? Um, Secondly, um, is there anybody here who have attended one of those funerals or weddings in, in such a way? No one wants to admit. <laughs> oh, well, we've got one. So, 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 if I'm, so the Taiwan is here. Yeah, no, no, you've, you've got one behind you. Oh, really cool. So, <laughs> most of the Taiwan is here from the city. Okay. Oh, well, let's oh, yeah. ask. Are, are most people, is, how many people, if you're from Taiwan, are from the city? How many people grew up in the countryside? Well, you can't generalize like that because things happen in, in the city as well. Isn't it? So. Well, it, oh, oh, not this, really. Uh, it's, it's really been limited in, in downtown area, and so it's become much more of a, a rural phenomenon, I think. I, when it first began, in their age group, I, I think city or not makes a big difference. Maybe the audience didn't hear the question too well, so if you ask the question again, I think there will be probably more. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Julia, you speak Taiwan? No, I mean, uh, whoever has, has attended this such okay. event. Okay, how, how many people have seen this event? Uh, 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 in the distance. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, so you're right. <laughs> okay. uh, do you want to answer the 
Uh, the first question, if they are outdoor? It seems like a, um, like an outdoor open air event. Yes, so, yes, they are outdoor. So it's open to the public? They are open to the public. There's no gates or anything. No wall between. It's, a, it's open. Is it normally in a square in front of temple or just on the street? Or uh, you saw the dance of what? So they, they are literally a truck. They're performing on the truck and then they just drive us through the streets. So that's open to the public. And there's nobody saying who can watch, who cannot watch, child should avoid. There's no such thing. It's open to the public. And in fact, one of the scenes, you, you may not remember, there was this wonderful scene where the woman was dancing and they had the fan blowing her hair back. Uh, that wasn't a fan, that was because there was a typhoon coming. <laughs> <laughs> she was really using it to really wonderful effect. Yes, it, uh, well, uh, so we've got, got two follow-up, or, or got three follow-up well, questions. Well, okay, what so illegal things did you see? <laughs> I mean, I guess I could say, I could, you know, part of the thing is, were I writing about it, I could probably write about it because you could protect people's identity. You could make things up, different city, etc. With a film, it's not. Uh, we we'll probably better discuss in private about what legal, illegal we see. Okay. You think? Or, okay, uh, I've been vetoed. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I was going to tell you everything, that. but, but yeah. no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just following up to what you just said about uh, how you feel this uh, couple of officials, um, the one thing I feel missing in this film is an interview of uh, Taiwanese in, uh, feminists. But, but, I, but, but it's not a, a major miss, I think, because I think you this film successfully portrayed a, a contradicting views out of the, the, the for, for example, it's the, uh, the scholars, the professors from Seneca. Yeah. The two of them, one is very, uh, oh, the other one, we, 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 we may roll, is she's not from Seneca, but she, but, she was actually, yes, she, yes, now she's, she was. and she, she's more positive about it, and that juncture is more ambivalent, yes. and, and you see this ambivalence in, you know, in the two officials as well, mm -hmm. and, and I want to uh, share this, this um, fact, that actually Shanghai Sanjie made the, the, the three mm -hmm. sister performers, they will use uh, her journey, the, the radical feminists, or the, the normal feminists in Taiwan, normal Shan, doesn't like it, using yeah. it as a positive example for, sure. for just like when you say that they are very you know, skilled, uh, labor skilled workers, mm -hmm. and they, they have this uh, agency. Mm -hmm. but, but, but of course, more conservative feminists will attack them. And then I think this, this really, really um, represents the, the, the period of transformation in, in Taiwan, that you have all kinds of value change, including uh, the view on sexuality and the female agency. These are, I, I'm really glad you're, you're, you've entered the conversation, because I, I think uh, having some knowledge of the, the feminist movement and some of the legal issues is really a contribution to this conversation. Having said that, I think I think the Chunre is is not a, what most people would think of as a mainstream feminist. She's one of my favorite scholars. I love her work, but you know her idea of feminism is you cannot reform men. Let's all go out and have sex as, as women, which is a, you know. I, and I love I love her analysis with that, and she's really provoking mainstream society. I'm not sure she's, she's representative of most people who are concerned with the gender issues of this. Uh, but I think you're right, it's, it, it, it would have been a wonderful discussion to include. I think the reason I didn't uh, present more, although I, I, I think you're right, the Lin Mei Rong especially probably represents a very feminist uh, analysis of this, is, is getting back to this fear of criticism issue. And I felt that the information about the critical side of this was all out there already before I made the film. And so I thought my job was to dialogue with that. What I, part of this is, and this leads to, in the end, you being correct, though, but I think, in retrospect, I think I should have included more of that because a non-Taiwanese audience hasn't heard that other argument. And even a young audience here from Taiwan. Well, and the young and aged. So I, I think you're right. It could have been, 
I could have done a wider source, and, and, and it, these were all very difficult choices to make, uh, but the underlying rationale was, again, this anthropological imperative that other people could go report it and, and attack it and, and criticize it. My job is to figure out what's going on from their perspective and present that to the world. Uh, but, but again, we, these are some of the best questions I've ever had, so I, I appreciate your input. Okay, um, let's go one more uh, follow-up question, and, and Ben, let's just take the two questions, and then I think we'll, we should move to our reception. Okay, yes. Um, just a really quick uh, question, actually. Um, how often do these kind of things happen? Because, I say, in a given square mile, once a month, just a really simple question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah because they seem to, you know, they must bring the whole area to a standstill. Mm -hmm. Do you want to see what you want to do? I can't, I, I don't have the accurate answer to that, but just based on what I've seen and what people told me. And we filmed this about, it's, we filmed this in 2008, right? Um, these, these performance, because the government um, prohibits, it's, it has been reduced. It's not as triumph as maybe 90s, 80s, 90s. And also the heat of the economy, a lot of our interviewee were saying that, that they, a lot of people now doesn't have the money to hire them. They are expensive. So about the frequencies, how often, how often people die? How often people die who also have money? Yeah, yeah. So I guess it's really hard to quantify <laughs> this. And about the temple, even um, it has, you can see more often around July because that's um, lunar month, lunar year. July in, 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 in the lunar July. Lunar July because that's our ghost month. So if you go to a countryside, you probably see more frequently than in the city. You won't see any because the the local government prohibit. They cannot perform in Taipei City, for example. That's why a lot of um, uh, the audience here from Taiwan, from the city side, they say they, they never sing it. But me grew up in the countryside, I sing it. I see my classmates being so excited they heard about performers tonight, they're going to see it. Um, so about a, I, I just cannot quantify the, the, the frequency for you, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And our last question for Ben. Um, I'm just looking at some of the more extravagant ones. I, I got a feeling I felt sorry for a guy who had a funeral the next day and he's a pauper. Is it just, um, what's your interpretation of, is it a show of wealth? I mean, it, you, people mentioned that it is encompassing for everyone. Uh, but what's your view as studying this? Is it one man's show, of, you know, I amassed a fortune, I can put on this show, I can hire strippers and this, that, and the other. Uh, what's your interpretation of that? And, i got to ask a quick question on the politics students. So is there any correlation with, um, you said it started in the 80s with de democracy and that. Did it, did it correlate with that? Yesterday, I, I had a lack of politics students. Today, I actually have, I could, uh, was making about a, a quarter of politics. Yeah. You, you can avoid that. Like so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, again, I, I'm, I'm, you are all raising some of the best questions I've ever had. So I, I really appreciate the way you're all engaging with this in a very sophisticated way. Uh, absolutely, it had to do with the lifting of martial law. And this isn't something that could have taken place before that. It also had to do with 1985 being the, the really the booming economy was taking off. And so people had money to spend in a way they never had before. So this gets to your conspicuous consumption <laughs> issue. Um, it, and at this time, it was a religious flourishing and that maybe also was connected to the lifting of martial law a bit. I mean, there were all kinds of religious developments. For example, my first book was on uh, the belief uh, appeasing aborted fetuses. And this also kind of began and took off in the mid-80s. So, or Robert Weller's work on the 18 Lord's Temples, which were kind of these mafioso ghosts that would you know, you'd leave cigarettes instead of burning incense, uh, and prostitute and gangsters would do this. So this was a time of real flourishing religion, but also a time where the 
the highest gods, uh, um, the, the, the more established gods, were, were kind of being edged away by the underworld gods in some ways. And so, it, to me, it's one of the most interesting and wonderful periods of Taiwan religion to look at. Uh, sometimes groups would get together and pitch in. So a whole village might pitch in uh, for a mayor who had passed away, for example. This was pretty common. Um, I, I think often uh, uh, kind of Taiwan mafiosos would it be a way of showing conspicuous consumption. And to me, one of the paradoxes of this or is in the tensions is that it was a way to show your wealth among people who were not known for being wealthy. So it wasn't something that old money would do. Mm -hmm. It was something that new money would do, or poor people would pitch together to do. Yeah, excellent question. OK, um, on that note, we should uh, move to our reception. Let's give Mark one more. Um,